that it's probably important to, to take a pause once you've made that, you've been given that diagnosis, to really think about what are the things you're feeling, what kind of emotions are you going through. It's an intense situation and it's okay to feel a whole bunch of different emotions, anger, sadness, frustration. Um, and I think it's important when you're first diagnosed to just let those feelings kind of come in and, and, and feel them. I had a biopsy and it was a phone call and the doctor called up and said, I'm sorry, you have cancer. And I said, I'm sorry, you must have the wrong number because there was just so much going on wrong in my life that I couldn't possibly have cancer. That was my initial response. I received the news at work because I had said to the radiologist that had done the biopsy, I really would not want to come back in the office just for you to give me the news, call me. And so she did. So when I got off the phone, I just stood there and just said, wow. Um, I didn't call anyone. I just continued with my work day. Um, I went home. Um, and I didn't even say anything when I first went home because I really needed to try and figure out how to deliver the news. How are you going to process the information that's just been given? Certainly, I advocate talking to your family and people that are closest to you, but I think it's probably smart to wait before you open it up to the, the wider audience. And the reason for that is that everybody's got a cancer story. Everybody knows somebody that's had cancer, a relative, a friend. And when you go out there and, and tell people, I have cancer, this is my diagnosis, you're going to hear stories that maybe you're not ready to hear. Initially, I spoke to my best friend, my children, and my family. Um, from there, what I did was um, write everything down in an email, a massive email, and send it to everybody. Um, I found there was so much information um, dumped on me that I couldn't take individual phone calls from people because it would make me more nervous. So what I did was put it all in um, uh, emails and send it out to everybody. I think it's good after diagnosis to have a couple of people who you can be very open with. Um, I found that it was difficult um, when I would tell someone that I had cancer, they would cry <laughs> and they would want someone to hug them. And it took five or six people before I realized that that was going to be a normal response. Um, so it was nice to have a few people who I could speak to and I could let them know that I was scared because everybody else needed reassurance from me. Patients um, and dealing with their families, that issue comes up all the time. And I, I see a lot of patients who don't even want to tell their family that they've been diagnosed with cancer. And I think that's because they're worried about how their family's going to handle it. You know, they've been the caretaker. They're used to kind of being okay and taking care of everyone else. And so not talking to your family, I believe, creates actually more problems. That family and loved ones know that things are going on. They sense that there's a problem. And it's that, that not knowing, that lack of information, that silence that can really make things kind of balloon. So I think it's very important from the beginning to talk to your family members, to let them know what's happening, to let them know how you're feeling, to talk about your feelings, your concerns about them and their feelings. I watched uh, my family members, all four of my grandparents and both of my parents died of cancer. And I saw them sort of play games about what they said, to who, when. And I'm on the page that sort of said that there was sort of an enormous burden to all of that. So I'm on the page that says you try to have uh, full and open disclosure. I told everybody uh, pretty much everything and it puts you in a more comfortable space. So I actually didn't tell my husband till a day later. Um, and then, you know, had to, cause I had to build myself up for the shock that he was going to have. So, you know, I told him and he was like, okay, well, you know, life has to go on. So what are our next steps? Um, and each person that I told, I had to actually sit down over breakfast, lunch, or dinner and try to communicate just to help them uh, with the experience. I think it's really good um, to let people know what you need, um, either emotionally or logistically. Um, everybody wants to help really badly because they feel very helpless. And so um, I feel like it was important for me to be able to say, I don't need anything right now, but 
it's going to be really helpful if you could watch my kids for me on this afternoon or, you know, I would love it if you would bring my family dinner. So there are many ways of getting support and probably the most immediate and available on demand is one's family and friends. And uh, uh, the one thing I should point out, there isn't a regimented system that people have to follow. Um, I generally recommend to patients is to go with what they think they're comfortable with first. And if things cannot be handled um, at a personal and family and friends level, uh, then I uh, generally there are different support mechanisms available uh, for patients. I feel that support groups, you have to shop around. It's kind of like looking for a therapist. You have to find a place where you fit in. I was pretty far along in treatment when I found a support group that I actually clicked with. I often find that, you know, on the journey, although you may have family, friends, spiritual advisors, and, you know, great doctors, if people have not been on the journey, they really don't understand what you're going through. And oftentimes, you really don't want to have to say a lot of words. You want someone to get it. And everyone else who has not been on the journey, you find yourself you know, with you know, a thousand words, and they're still looking at you puzzled as to, what do you mean? I sought help. I asked friends who had gone through the same thing and they advised me and helped me because they had already gone through this process. One of the things that we found is that uh, family members can be immensely helpful, but until you've gone through the process of hearing a cancer diagnosis, you aren't sort of in the same spot. And what we have is a band of brothers that have gone through that experience and, you know, I would sort of say there's sort of a network effect here, which is, you know, if you've got three buddies and you're doing a home improvement project, one of them can probably help you with a problem. But if you've got 500 people and you ask the question, you're going to have somebody that knows exactly uh, what you're up against and be able to make a contribution. I did participate in a support group that was for moms with young children. Um, and. So it was, it was a small group that didn't meet very frequently, um, but it was neat just to sort of be in a group of people who had very similar experiences to me. But you've gone through the same thing as other people, although at different ages or different stages of cancer or different types of cancer, but you understand their situation. People need to do what they're comfortable with, and it's very individual. It's individual, it's cultural. So my suggestion to newly diagnosed people would be to uh, communicate your needs as best as possible and keep in the forefront that, you need, that we need somebody to take care of us. As a mom and as a woman, I found that I was a primary caretaker for a lot of people. Through this experience, I learned that I needed to go to people that would help take care of me in this situation because I had the needs. There were family members that were toxic to my situation, and I learned early on that I couldn't have them in my life at that time because it was detrimental to my own health. And that was a bit awkward, but it was something that you have to learn along the way. Once you've been on the cancer journey, you really need to start reflecting and assessing what's best for you. And it's not really about anyone else. Uh, so if you have to let people go with love, it's probably the best thing for you to do at that point in time just for your own healing. Remember, doctors aren't there just to take care of the physical part of cancer. The mental part is very important. And what I tell patients is this, is that partnering at the mental level is very critical because this is how the body heals. What I didn't understand was that there were counselors specifically for cancer. So um, I started seeing an oncology counselor. Um, it was free. And the first thing I said to her was, I'm almost done treatment and um, now I'm so depressed I can't get out of bed. And her response was that you're exactly where I'd expect you to be. You've been at war for your life. And now that things are starting to wind down, you're realizing like, holy cow, I had cancer. And all the emotions are bubbling up. Um, she pointed me to exercise programs. Um, and um, to start out very slow, I was very weak. So that was an eye opener for me. Um, but I also, through the counselor, started taking um, a poetry writing class and a journaling class. And it was with other survivors. And I felt very comfortable in that environment. 
And if you need to go to a therapist, it's not to be embarrassed to say, oh, I'm going to a therapist, I'm crazy. You're not crazy, you're just really trying to fortify yourself in order to cope, uh, because you definitely need everything. You need an arsenal to get through this. So cancer is, as I said, a very um, traumatic and dramatic diagnosis for someone to receive. And everybody, no matter who you are and how strong you think you are, needs some kind of support.